So as we uh, get near the time, it's officially 10 o'clock. I'm just going to wait for a few couple minutes for people to arrive. But I'll just give a little background. This will, is being recorded. Uh, we started a few minutes ago, so I didn't get to record it. I tend to do. So I just want to remind everybody that's tuning in to please mute your mics or I'll mute them for you. Uh, welcome to the very first in the uh, EPS summer series uh, on suns, uh, results in the field. So in the past couple of years, uh, we've seen a remarkable number of field programs at Rutgers in both, both Earth and Ocean Sciences. There's been cruises, uh, 3D cruises on shore in New Jersey, uh, Argentina, seismic exploration, Jim Wright, Indonesia, drilling by Yair, drilling off the Chilean margin led by Sam Bova and, and, and Yair, Colorado Plateau drilling by Dennis Kent and Paul Olson and team, onshore New Jersey drilling at Medford, uh, plus uh, numerous expeditions uh, have gone down to Antarctica, uh, uh, led by Oscar and uh, Josh and others, Rob Shrell. Um, plus there's been some exciting developments in both Martian landers and lunar sampling and opening up of samples. And, you know, that said, we just had cancellation of the Reykjanes Ridge drilling expedition. Yair was going to sail on. It was officially canceled yesterday. It was supposed to sail late June for drilling uh, in a, a long profile of Reykjanes Ridge. A fantastic uh, proposal. Uh, that both tectonics and uh, paleoceanographic significance. And so in this COVID world of not getting out to the field, I was supposed to be getting out of the Grand Canyon right now and choppering out after seven days of going down and doing field work, come home for the weekend for Memorial Day, and then, and then going back out to look in the field at the book cliffs. Uh, and that's not happening, as you might expect. Uh, so everything in 2020 for field is uh, going to make 2021 look like deja vu all over again as everything gets re-canceled and rescheduled for 2021. So that said, I thought it would be a good idea to everybody to just take a pause and tell us about their exciting uh, field work. And I asked Dennis Kent as to be our first speaker. He and Paul Olson led the Colorado Plateau drilling projects, first phase of drilling and painted desert. Uh, the picture that I'm projecting is about two and a half hours, to be honest, away from Painted Desert, but it's in the same general vicinity. And this is the Moen Kopi Formation, uh, which has been drilled at Painted Desert. So there is a direct connection. This is actually at Lee's Ferry, which is mile marker zero if you're going down the Grand Canyon. So without that further ado, I'm going to introduce Dennis Kent. Uh, Dennis Kent received his PhD uh, from Columbia University, Lamont. Uh, he was there for approximately 30 years. He came to Rutgers in uh, 1998. And as of about a month from now, he will be officially retiring from Rutgers after serving us for 22 years. Uh, Dennis, I was interested to see in the newspaper that you, that you are a paleogeographer. I read that today in the newspaper online. I mean, you can't get false information online, right? So that's an alternate fact. He does reconstruct past paleogeography. Uh, what he does is basically he's a paleomagician. For those of you who have not heard that term, you should. Paleomagic is, uh, who coined that term, uh, Dennis, or just organic? Jealous people. <laughs> I think it was Bergeron. So, <laughs> I know Bergeron was the one who used it more than any other people. Uh, so he works on paleomagnetism and uh, recording of the Earth's magnetic field. And of course, that you can do so much with that tool and applying it to so many different areas. And Dennis uh, has done that from deep sea cores and polarity reversals to reconstructing paleo latitudes and in the Earth's magnetic field itself through time, and, and including things like polar wander. Lots of exciting stuff. So without further ado, Dennis, if you want to pull down your share button and share content PowerPoint. 
I will try to do that. Hold on. I don't know. You folks see the right thing? We see the bear pole. Okay. Well, that's the a bear pole, our utility pole, and uh, snuggling up to it. And so if we tune out, that's the reason the pole has collapsed. Um, so what I want to talk about is by Ken's invitation is a Colorado Plateau Coring Project. It's uh, largely about red rock, so it's uh, continental sediments. Um, I approached it from uh, uh, as a paleomagnetist, and the reason, uh, by the way, parenthetically, sometimes uh, uh, from a as a paleogeographer is that. Uh, Paleomagnetism is uh, probably, and I think realistically, the only way of telling latitude in the past. So uh, this is sort of a theme on, on, that doesn't come strongly into this particular uh, presentation, although the other aspect of the field that's useful does, which is the polarity reversals. And since the core is where the field has generated each of these phenomena on a global basis, and so that's the kind of the physical conceptual way in which um, you can operate on a global scale for correlation, for example. Uh, so the, the this is a uh, Colorado Plateau coring project, and uh, various authors are listed here, and there's many others that have now uh, been become participants of this. This is uh, results, uh, the initial key results of the first phase, the second phase is in the planning process, and Chris uh, Chris Leeper will talk about that next week. I think that's the scheduled talk. Um, Dennis, uh, it, have you advanced your slide? Because it has not advanced for me. I don't know about other people. Sorry about it. Yeah, that's my fault. Hmm. Mm -hmm. You advance it on the PowerPoint. Don't use the. You should move to the PowerPoint window, and use it as a regular presentation. Uh, oh, how's that? That's good. Ah, that's right. You you got must have got tired of looking at the bear pole. Uh, <laughs> right. So anyway, <laughs> rocks and anyway, this part will be uh, focused on the late Triassic as. Uh, Shown here at the top of this diagram, that's the uh, base of the uh, uh, Chin Lee formation. The uh, the uh, red rocks are Paleomagnetus' favorite because uh, essentially they their color is from hematite rust, very stable at the Earth's surface. The magnetizations the carries are very stable, both uh, magnetically and uh, and. Uh, uh, from the chemical point of view, it's a stable phase. And uh, uh, good, here we go. So the uh, anyway, the the problem with the red rocks though is that they don't have this kind of sparse in fossils, and certainly don't have marine fossils, which most of the time scale is based on. So what what I want to present is a is a, a look at the late Triassic using literally red, red rocks and different aspects of it in two widely separated areas. And uh, focus will be on the late Triassic. And that's the, uh, that also, also happens to be the, the main age of the rocks that uh, which that many of us or you folks are certainly are sitting on, which is the Newark Basin. And this is, uh, you've heard this before, I want to quickly just give you the framework for what we did in the Colorado Plateau, because it is, the motivation does come, it comes strongly for the work done in the Newark Basin over, over a number of years, which was also a, a subject of a uh, coring project, as, as you'll see in a moment. So the, uh, there's roughly... Well, the Triassic is about 50 million years. Late Triassic is about two thirds of it. You can see the dates uh, used to calibrate it. They're fairly sparse. And one of the objectives here was to try to get a further uh, time scale for this uh, interval of time. 
So Newark basins are up and down the East Coast and in joining margins of Africa at the New Ghana Basin. And we're gonna focus on the Newark Basin. And a uh, familiar picture that, um, that Roy and others and myself have shown in various classes. So do I have a point? I don't know if I have a pointer. Use your uh, mouse and it makes, it makes, if you use your mouse, the arrow can be used. Can you see it? I'm doing it now. Yes. Okay. You can see it. Yeah, good. Thank you. Move it slowly. Okay. Anyway, uh, so there's a Newark Basin. This is, uh, let's see, let me get some of this other stuff. I can't. New York City is there, is Manhattan. And uh, we are here, our Rutgers. And uh, here's the Wachungs. It's a half robin. Normal boil falls on the west and uh, sediments distributed up and down going across the Delaware River to Pennsylvania. Um, Triassic, it goes up as the light blue and essentially this in the Wachung syncline and elsewhere is Jurassic. The, uh, there's a lot of sediment in here and a lot of it is pretty well exposed, but the great thickness of it you'll see sort of uh, requires a lot of uh, mapping and things to put it together. So there's terrific outcrops. And one would say, one might ask and should ask, why bother drilling here, which, which we eventually did. So here, for example, you can see, uh, this is the Lakatong formation. You see the dark, uh, dark beds and the reddish beds. These are essentially lake level cycles black beds when uh, the lake was deep and became sediments became more anoxic and red when red red when it was emerged and then places in between this is the type of stuff that uh, Paul Olson has studied and they call there's a whole variety of there's a, a family or a hierarchy of cycles and uh, ranging from the the percent Alton cycles and uh, then grouped into 100k long, intriguing, very long cycles of around uh, 1.8 million years. You can see below there uh, the scaling of these things as map where available. So this is the basic unit we're going to largely focus on the uh, the McLaughlin cycles. And this is where all in, uh, the members, like the Metlas member, the Percasy, et cetera, these are all essentially 400K cycles. And these cycles are of water 60 meters thick. So this is uh, most outcrop phases are not even that much. In fact, that quarry only had one or two of these, uh, these kind of cycles. So this is one of the problems of trying to do cycle stratigraphy and various other things on outcrop in this type of basin. More typically, the outcrops look like this, you know, looking around, even around the uh, Rutgers campus. One uh, sees pl plenty of red rocks every time they build a foundation. It's basically often very well exposed. Uh, this is a sort of an opportunity, is uh, got this photo from Paul's from Frenchtown, New Jersey and uh, just near the Delaware River. And this happens to be the hometown of my uh, of uh, my dear departed friend and mentor, Neil Updike. This is great stone. He has his Pangea with a uh, the dipole field show. And he's, uh, I bring him up besides the personal contact is and growing up in the Newark Basin, he was one of the first who actually did paleomagnetism on the on the red beds. Most of the work previously had been done in the lavas, which were much easier to, uh, more strongly magnetized and tended to be targets. So uh, given the the mapping was already available, these uh, the sections uh, we were blessed with a, uh, a grant from the National Science Foundation to let us drill this. Here's the first site at Rutgers. Uh, this is well before I was, uh, officially a member of the uh, organization, but they kind of let us put us out somewhere in old army property where they ran tanks around that this was okay to drill on. 
Uh, so this was the first site, and then uh, we drilled six of these sites in half uh, in six months. The other site, the the final site in this array, the sixth one, was at Princeton, and uh, Amico was the uh, driller. They wanted to test their stuff on a in a uh, in a, a relatively uh, benign environment, New Jersey, before they flew all this stuff out to East Africa. So the uh, the drilling here's a cross section. So it was from the mapping we could determine uh, essentially put the sites together. The bottom of one was the top of another with key beds, and here's the section, some like five six thousand meters of stratigraphic section, and. And getting to the point is uh, there'll be more pictures, Ken, don't worry. Uh, but the, is uh, the, the astrochronology, which is the, the key timing mechanism in for these sediments. And this is, uh, this is shown with the various, uh, uh, looking at various um, measures of lithologic change that could be related to climate, specifically lake levels, precipitation. Uh, so here is Paul's depth ranks that was shown in that earlier cartoon, a diagram for different cycles. And here are various power, this is not various, this is a power spectra from one interval in the Lakatong, is the places where it has the largest uh, amplitude. and. And here's so here's a, a raw power spectrum done by depth. And so there's first of all there are peaks, so there's significant concentration at certain uh, periodicities. And this is uh, so this uh, period, this uh, power spectrum is compared to one for what's known, say, the last five million years from looking at the uh, eccentricity of modulated climate precession index. And that's the power space. So here's the actual. Uh, time series, here's the power spectra shown here below. And so to first order, trying to match these periods to these, it looks like this prominent one here is the 400,000 year uh, cycle eccentricity modulation. And here's the twin 100s, and then here less well resolved is the precession. So it's a 400 K cycle that really becomes the backbone of this of constructing a time scale for this five, six, four, four to five thousand meter section. Dennis, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, forgive me. <laughs> How do you independently determine this time from besides the magnetism? It's not done. There's so far. There's uh, very little magnetism we're, we're uh, talking about, and the the. Uh, the time at this stage is done simply by the power spectra similarity to what uh, what is known and then thinking of how do you get period first of all it's periodic and yes. periodic then well what are our options so it's annual well that's not plausible you know there's actually varves in sediments here you can get some idea of sedimentation rates so then you go across the orbital gap there really no Period, uh, periodic climate phenomena from a year from annual out to the uh, precession. And so that's when the argument is constructed from there. So you have no radio dating. You have no uh, fossils, right? That's right. Well, there's a few bones here and there and some pollen. Uh, so, okay. So the dating is relatively uncertain, I guess. Very uncertain. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's good. No, good question. You set it up. This is the this is the this is uh, 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 leads up to how to date these to answer your very question. There's I'll get to the I'll get to the point how we do date that in a minute. And uh, but anyone, please feel free to interrupt. This should be hopefully kind of an informal way of presenting some of this stuff. So that's the that's the and it's an argument based on periodicities, plausibility, and then constrained by some rudiments of what the sediment accumulation rate is. At the low end, it's VARBs. At the high end, it's what fossils are available, how much time is represented. It's millions of years. So that's the kind of the sandwich that to put the baloney in. The dates that do there are dates now is and 
and the dates are only here. If you see my pointer up here in the so-called uh, Wachung lava flows, these Orange Mountain and, and, uh, and so forth. And these are represented, let's see, let's move it along. Like for example, the famous Palisade Sill looking from New York over to, uh, to New Jersey. And these are part of a very large um, uh, volcanic and igneous province called the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, perhaps the largest footprint of one of these large igneous provinces around. And these are the rocks, these are the rocks that provide actual dates. And those are shown here. And so again, we have the column of uh, the, the different colored sediments representing cycles. Here's in depth ranks, more quantified, can also be seen in resistivity logs and things like that. Uh, the, uh, the polarities, Paul mentioned, uh, magnetics the magnetics are used and they will use be used in a more profound way in a moment uh, these mainly used to correlate to help correlate between the cores and the secondly is to put together a sequence of these things from the assembled cores but the dates getting back to the dates these all come from the uh, central atlantic magmatic province U Uranium lead on batiolites and zircons. This is the analysis done in a paper by uh, Tim uh, Terry Blackburn and others at uh, at the late uh, late lab at uh, of, uh, of uh, what's uh, uh, geez, uh, at MIT. They provide a couple of interesting things. One is these lavas are in, have interbedded sediments, and Paul Olson and Roy Schlisch and others have made interpretations of their cyclicity. And so to the question, how do you know, is now can be partly addressed, at least for this interval, by the dates associated with the igneous rocks, these very precise and uh, accurate uranium lead dates. And so to summarize, the duration of the igneous activity as deduced from the astronomical, i.e. the cyclicity, is virtually identical to what can be deduced for these uh, package of uh, igneous rocks from the uranium lead date. So this suggests that the basic astrochronology or the interpretation of cycles as Paul has them is correct. The second point is that the dates are only up here, so it's now one has to uh, extrapolate knowledge of these cycles and believe them to then date the rest of this particular oops, section. Let's go back for a second. Okay, so this is, now this is a dangling chronology. And there are no other dates in this, uh, in this section. So this, nonetheless, here's, here's what the, uh, the section comes out looking like. Uh, here's the cores. This is in depth. And these numbers are to, uh, the 405k cycles, assuming that these are correctly identified. The plat now then cast into time, millions of years, based on this cyclicity and suspend it all from the base of the Camp Igneous rocks in the Newark Basin. Uh, in order to call these things just parenthetically, which I won't go into here, but to call this Norian, Retian, et cetera, these are all stages from the marine realm, and there are no marine fossils in here. So how do we know what, uh, why should we call this Norian, for example, or actually late Triassic for that matter? And that comes from top uh, marine section. So here's a little bit of a photograph. A great place from Sicily, central Sicily, wonderful place to do field work. Um, and here's a section, it's been tectonized, standing up at a high angle, has ammonites and conodonts, all these uh, kind of fossil groups that allow these rocks to be delineated in terms of Reetian, Norian, Carnian, and so forth. And this, we did a polarity stratigraphy, colleague here, Giovanni Mutoni. These marine rocks, and they're related to the 
polarity time scale I just described from the Newark Basin to tie marine rocks into the not into the continental. So here's an example where you have the only thing really in common are the polarity zones. You don't have fossils in common. You have cycles in common. There's actually there's some indi there's cyclicity in these things, as you can almost well not almost you can visually see, but cycles are repetitive. You don't know which one you're in from one place to the other unless you have some independent means of correlation. And so this is done with the polarity stratigraphy. So this is the game, right? This is where the polarity stratigraphy starts playing an increasingly large role in trying to relate sections with different properties, in this case, marine fossils with the continental record and the polarity record. Um, but there, there's some a bit of controversy though, even though you can do the correlation, it doesn't necessarily mean the section's complete because nature, again, with cyclicity, you can remove any arbitrary numbers and you, you'd be hard pressed to know that they're missing. And so uh, Spencer Luke, for example, uh, made the case, made an argument based on concostricans, freshwater crustaceans, uh, biostatistic stratigraphy such as it is, pollen, uh, suggesting that you're missing the entire region in the Newark Basin. And so this sets up the problem of completeness. And so the implication of their analysis is that our view is it's complete, their view you're missing th uh, 3 million years. The date is above this uh, supposed purported hiatus. So the date stands is just that how you extrapolate the uh, cycles below that, counting them below that is then is uh, may have 3 million years missing. And how would you know? Uh, you may say you should find evidence of a unconformity hiatus, but that's uh, those are not compelling arguments one way or the other. So the, the uh, the null hypothesis we made is that we do have a complete section, so let's find some place where we can date things lower down in the section. And that place, finally, we are at the Colorado Plateau. So here on the Colorado Plateau is a relatively thin, measured in hundreds of meters of uh, section for the equivalent rocks, in this case, Chin Li, the Chin Li Formation. And distributed over a wide over a wide area, and with mainly fluvial, some and not this the cyclicity or repetitiveness. But it's not clear what the what it uh, what it represents because you can have so-called autocyclic phenomena that could be a repetitive a meandering stream goes back and forth, but may not. Uh, it almost uh, hardly ever is periodic, even though it gives that appearance. So it doesn't have cycles per se. It has some fossils. Here's a fossil right there, right? Here's a, that's why it's called petrified forest. It's a, they're, pet, they're a petrified tree logs and plant fossils galore all over the place, but not especially age diagnostic. Um, here's, and, but here's, here's, here's Paul, uh, by the way, here's Paul Olson looking on, looking at the scene. But what these, what these sections do have are um, tefacious, tefacious sandstones with zircons that can be dated. So these have, and he, th this has been done in outcrop by several groups over the years. So these are a series of zircon dates uh, uh, available from outcrop of the of the uh, of the Chinle formation, but what's missing is getting a complete section through this particular, you know, through the entire Chinle. So the motivation of drilling here is not so much of huge thickness, although hundreds of meters doesn't occur at any uh, any particular outcrop, is that you don't is in order to assemble a complete section or a continuous section, which we need to get the polarity stratigraphy. The ordering correct is uh, is difficult in these type of terrain. So either you have very weathered, uh, very weathered um, outcrop, as a hammer, 
kind of uh, stuff that uh, is not is yeah, you have to dig down quite a bit to get fresh material. But even then, is to be able to correlate from one of these mesas to the other with key beds in a fluvial lacustrine system is not is not uh, is not trivial and e and nor easy. And people have is, tried to do this over the decades with various degrees of success. And our drilling show mostly it was not very successful, actually. So this was a project that pet uh, Colorado Plateau coring. We selected a site. The first site was in Petrified Forest National Park. Um, there was a, a paleontologist, uh, Bill Parker, who helped us to get a permit to drill here. It was in a parking lot, so it was fairly benign. Here it is on Chindi Point, uh, a place a little out of the way, but uh, nonetheless, you can see a key bed here. This is all kind of fairly flat lying is beds. And here's a key, key tuffaceous sandstone, something called a black forest bed. And that's one of the first units that's been dated with uranium lead, it goes back a number of years. And this has a fairly secure date, which is now even more secure with the dating we've done on this particular project. Um, so the coring, so coring happened if I was some a number of years ago now. Uh, focus on the chin leaf formation and in particular first the upper half where we hit we essentially satisfy some of our objectives and then the lower part that presented some additional problems that uh, in the process of being resolved by the way it's white colored not because it's snow it's it's a white it's a light colored sandstone here's look here's some of the cores is the uh, black forest bed with the zircons, so tens of meters thick. And here's, again, mostly ro uh, red rocks, paleosols, various uh, fluvial sandstones. Sedimentologists describe these in various ways. Notice the, notice the dips. I said the beds are flat lying, but we drill these 30 degrees from, from, from to uh, allow us to interpret, the, to essentially to uh, orient the cores because the magnetizations at this time in the late Triassic at this place are relatively flat. And so in order to determine polarities, we had to know the azimuthal orientation. And this was a effective way of doing that. So here's the basically, so the setup. So the idea is, uh, can we correlate the polarity stratigraphy sampled from these uh, from these cores chris by the way chris leeper did uh, most of the sampling and the measurements uh, incidentally on this on this uh, on the chin Li. and can we correlate those to the to the newark section and uh, we have a prediction of the ages from the newark can we verify or refute them from the null hypothesis standpoint what we obtain in the Chin Li formation. And this is one of these, uh, on many one's career, you get a remarkable result. And this was a remarkable result. So here's the, here's, you were, on a graphic polarity time scale. So remember, this was, this is now laying on its side, it's time. And uh, so getting older to your left. This is the date on the camp, and this is how the whole thing is suspended from this, counting cycles, assuming completeness, and each of these cycles being four hundred five thousand years, and uh, counting down, and then getting the polarity sequence in this with using these cycles as a way to uh, to iron out any changes in uh, apparent changes in sed rate, to essentially make it a linear time scale with those assumptions. And then Carlin, here's the core from the uh, petrified forest. Here's the polarity stratigraphy. Just incidentally, we sputted in on something called Bedahuchi, which is uh, late tertiary volcanics. That's why we don't show anything here. That's why the plateau essentially is uh, stands up resistant to erosion. And so here, but here's the Chin Li, the part of the Chin Li recovered here. Here's the polarity stratigraphy. 
And so this car, the polarity stratigraphy of here, we think correlates uniquely as a unique fingerprint for the uh, polarity time scale shown here. And here are the dates that obtained by uh, Connie Rasmussen and Roland Mundiel at, uh, in this case, the Berkeley lab and, uh, and the dates on level via the magnetics and you can see the lines of correlation. It's a, uh, it's a very, it's a very tight match. So this would, okay. So the argument is, I think, uh, I, I think that was Paul that's, that, that, uh, asked the question earlier is that how do you know the date? So this is the answer right here, at least for the upper, the uh, going back to about 215 million years. We know the dates from these uranium lead uh, measurements done correlated to the Newark using the magnetic polarity stratigraphy, which is what's expected to be in common. And it looks like there's a, a good match and there's good agreement. So this, this has a number of implications. One is, let's see, let me go on. One is that the, uh, the 405,000 year cycle is very stable going back well, 200, 215 million years. And where's that cycle? You know, what do we know about that cycle? Well, the computational limit of its stability done by Jacques Lascar Jacks in Paris is various models only allow us to determine its this its stability, i.e., conformance of different some different approximations. These are planetary interactions, and they after period after time they if you want to call it get chaotic or just become computationally noisy, uh, and so these can be extended back for the 405,000 year cycle, about 50 million years. And this is about it. So any of these, any, any time scale based on the 405 had to then make a choice of which ones, which of these models was the most appropriate. So this Used, they even put in relativistic terms on, on uh, terms for the various planetary motions to try to extend this. So this is this is about it. So in if uh, if our interpretation is correct, which we believe it is, then essentially we've made a prediction going back that allows us to date. Well, actually, it's a delta prediction in here from two hundred one to two fifteen. But we have no reason to doubt that these four hundred five thousand year term in eccentricity stays within a short, uh, uh, small difference out to about two, over 200 million years. In fact, it may be fairly constant going out for much longer than that. And the sort of the intuition of on this, the I mean, why should it be uh, so stable? This is the 405,000 years um, periodicity and eccentricity is due to the interaction of Jupiter and Venus. So Jupiter, the large planet near us, and Venus, a, a sister planet that's close to us, and their influence is, is uh, apt, not apt to be subject to chaotic effects or interaction with other bodies over, over long lengths of time. So that's, that's the same rationale or explanation, but this is the empirical um, demonstration of that. Uh, let me finish up. Venus, I have a question. Yeah. If you take a look at the, that plot, it looks like the periodicity is very, very constant for 250 million years. Why would it get more and more chaotic? It doesn't seem to change in any way over the last 250 million years in these models. So the, I'm not is, quite... Yeah, this is the constant. Oh, let me see. So this is the, uh, if uh, the zero line is when it's constant. So back to his zero time going back 50 million years, it is yeah. indeed, the, the, all these models, by the way, are in here. They're just on top of each other. You can't distinguish them, okay? Now, as you go farther back, depending, these are, these are various uh, iterations, some uh, different assumptions that go into the planetary motions. And you can see that the models diverge. First, they diverge, first of all, from being constant. None of them stays along this line. 
Secondly, they diverge from each other. I see that, but if you do a Fourier transform for any one of those, would you see a difference in the periodicity? If you did a, tra a Fourier transform on the calculations? Yes. Yeah, yeah, and that's what this is basically. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll take a look at that. Paper. Yeah, take a look, I mean, this, that's basically what it is. It's a computation that they then analyze the, uh, the periodicities. They've isolated this uh, G3, the, uh, the G2, G5 from these. All right, I'll take a look. Yeah, take a look. Yeah, no, that's uh, so. Uh, let me finish up here in a uh, kind of a, a, a little bit more on the dating side. You know, in one sense, we're very lucky with the result that I just described. Because when we now completed that, that uh, let me just go, I can do this easily. So this is, uh, this was just the upper part of the Chin Li. We're in the middle of the so-called Sancella member. There's an inkling that things may go awry. And you can see there's a date here that's sort of off this line that may be an unconformity. It could be many, could be many things. Uh, wisely stopped right there as uh, we had the result is clean there's some other issues coming up and indeed when we then finish the polarity stratigraphy and then try to combine that with the uranium lead dates in this case at this time we published this that was still in only available in outcrop and the result is shown here so here's the part upper part here I just showed you dates kind of cluster very well, whether it's a magnetic interpretation or using uranium lead, they give you the same apparent uh, sediment accumulation rate and they agree with the prediction from the York time scale. And that continues in one view down here to the base of the sun cellar and then there's a change. There's a, there's a lower sediment accumulation rate at the bottom based on magnetics. And now the a couple of things. One is if you look here, these dates, these are the dates from Sam Bowering's group, the deceased Sam, Sam uh, Bowering's lab, that don't agree with the magnetic interpretation here. Some of his dates are in the outcrop are here. They're fine. So it doesn't look like an interlab type of thing. These are Berkeley dates, these are MIT, you know, East Coast, West Coast agree on things so you've got to worry about that sort of stuff and but they agree here and they don't agree here so that doesn't look like an explanation the other problem could be is that the correlating the outcrop to the core may not be may have some difficulties and this indeed that's the point of drilling is to try to get a reference section and there's some work now being done trying to relate the outcrop areas into the core more precisely. But there's enough known from a paper in press by Connie Rasmussen and others that the problem still exists on zircon dates from the core itself. In other words, it looks like the zircon dates tend to be too old which is okay, they're detrital, you know, they come from somewhere, that, but they're very few juvenile ones, whereas up here, they seem to be, we've been very fortunate that the these detrital zircons were deposited a relatively short time before deposition, uh, before deposition, uh, yeah, before deposition. So, so there's a there's an interesting problem here in the detrital zircon dates that uh, needs to be resolved because there's a couple of interesting things that happen about in this in this time frame. One is you know way a far field effect is the Manicouagan impact dated uranium lead two fifteen and a half thereabouts by the MIT group, and that occurs right about here where we have at the same roughly the same time is this adamania revueltian boundary in the uh, in vertebrate fauna. This is about the only dramatic change in the fauna in this particular interval, and there's kind of an enticing 
uh, correlation between these two, uh, whether the impact has anything to do with this uh, biotic turnover. So whether that, but it could be that these are brought together because there's an unconformity here. That's the, that's the whole relevance. So if these dates are correct, there may be a whole, all this section may actually be missing in not only in the core, but in the local area. So that's a motivation to try to sort, uh, try to sort this out. And the, let me give you I'm almost uh, next to the last slide. So there's a, this, uh, Part of it's used for, I mean, some of them applications for geochronology, but others are for provenance. So this is a uh, uh, paper that's still still out there in review, being thrashed around. This is from the core, same core we discussed. These are so-called laser ablation dates. So these are very, very uh, rapidly obtained. You can do hundreds of zircons. Uh, fairly efficiently, they're not very, they're not very, they're not a very precise, nor are they thought to be very accurate because the zircons are not treated in any way to remove parts that have subject to lead loss. That's the big, that's like a big deal, it's so-called, that's why the other ones are called CA, chemical abrasion. They've been really cooked up with acids and trying to remove material that may not retain. Uh, delay that from the as a radioactive product. Anyway, so this is these are these are um, uh, profit for provenance studies. But here, let me point to the, here to the column here. These are dates. These are all the zircons that essentially a Triassic, essentially Triassic in age from the Chinle. This is going down section. This is toward the base of the Chinle. The, the Chinle as represented in petrified forest. <clears throat> and so what you so what what one sees what I see and I is and so here's a histogram of these dates and I put in that's my arrow I put over it. there's hardly any difference in those and so this in other words they they look like the same similar modes and uh, and so the, the the zircons look like they could have been just uh, I mean at the at the limit they could have been one introduction of a big blast of of uh, some volcanic eruption somewhere that introduced zircons into this uh, depositional basin, and then these got progressively recycled up up through the section into the lower part of this uh, through the uh, lower uh, Sancella. In the upper part, there may have been additional eruptions. There may have been different, uh, just different drainage changes in draining. Now you see a more of a progression in these uh, laser ablation days to getting younger and younger and younger. And so this is the part that may have introduced more and more juvenile zircons that then with proper selection and, uh, and uh, treatment may provide the dates that seem to give us very good uh, temporal control. So looking back again, let me go back to this here. So this part, then she threw it to the middle Sancella gives very good agreement, whereas this lower part does not, which we think, at least some of us think, is the correct uh, uh, chronology, chronostratigraphy. And these, I think, are variably, uh, one interpretation, these are variably contaminated by, uh, by recycled uh, zircon that have not been, not been adequately separated from ones that may be juvenile. So this is... So this is a general problem with uh, detrital zircon geochronology because they detrital, you know, how, but the question is how detrital. So let me wrap up here finally with a couple of concluding remarks. Um, so the, I mean, the first order conclusion and actually a key objective for, uh, for the doing the Colorado Plateau coring is to get dates, dates that can be used to verify or refute or modify the New York uh, polarity time scale, but it, the outcome was that I think we can say with very good confidence the time scale is complete to within probably a hundred k cycle from back to about two hundred fifteen million years. Uh, it shows the region is not missing in the New York, and this is a this is a problem of provincialism. 
we think, I think, uh, these kind of fossils, conchostrogens, you know, are not widely distributed. Some even know how they get from one place to the other. And, um, and also plants, the same plants don't grow, you know, throughout the world. So if you find plants in one area, you may not find them in the other. It doesn't necessarily mean you're missing time. You're just in the wrong climate belt, as any gardener might surmise. Um, the 405, thousand year cycle I think is a really uh, it uh, it looks to be the best clock we know the most stable clock that we know in the geologic record so it's it's like it's a metronome as a single period the 100k cycle is always problematic because there's split there's a 95 and 125 precession is kind of too short has its own issues because of uh, tidal dissipation effects on the shape of the earth um, and so the 405 is maybe a very good way of partitioning time. It's, it's about the same duration, comparable duration to most fossil zones like 4M and, and nanofossil zones. So it's kind of tuned well to a lot of uh, geological phenomenon that we can, uh, we can hope to resolve. And then finally, the part that uh, you should invite Paul to give a talk on is the, it actually has implications for the chaotic behavior of the solar system because uh, not, the, not, the, not the constancy of the 405, but actually differences in that other one I mentioned, the 1.8, which today is 2.4 million years is a difference. And that difference is interpreted uh, can be interpreted as actually direct evidence of um, of chaotic behavior. Basically, it's Mars. It's the influence of Mars on Earth's orbit. It's a kind of a small planet getting thrashed around out there, and eventually that's reflected in uh, subtle ways, but um, resolvable ways in Earth's uh, in Earth's relation to the Sun and how it gets climate. So thanks for your attention. And next week, I remind you, Chris, will uh, this is uh, essentially what some of the key objectives of phase one. And uh, we're in planning stages of a second phase that Chris is taking a leading role on. So uh, you'll hear from him next week. Thanks.